We've seen the sort of just stop oil activists spraying up various streets, particularly targeting the the think tanks of fifty five Tufton Street. Mm, that retired bouncer from South London with the orange paint and the yeah. <laughs> it's getting weirder, isn't it? I, yeah. I might, you know, it just especially when it was start, suddenly starting to target paintings, and also the more that they kind of get drawn out into the open, the more you kind of get the sense that oh, you really believe this. Mm. And by believe, I don't mean you think climate change is a problem. A lot of people think that, but I mean the kind of apocalyptic narrative. Because at that point, surely anything is justified. I mean, yeah. it's not hard to justify spray painting 55 Tufton Street as you know bad as that is. That's not terrorism. Mm. But at the same time, you do kind of get this sense of what they've been saying for a very long time, which is everyone's going to die. It doesn't matter if we block an ambulance. It doesn't matter if we risk defacing a great work of art. Mm. It just, I think it just shows the dangers of that kind of apocalyptic mindset. Because if you really hold to that, there's all sorts of things you'd be prepared to do, let alone, you know, just a bit of paint on Tufton Street or somewhere else. But Yeah, James, what have you made of those protests and particularly the, the kind of art protests? You know, they're throwing um, soup at great works of art, I saw from, even from Holland because it's an international thing, someone um, gluing themselves to a Vermeer and then throwing soup on themselves. I don't understand what the soup metaphor is, no. but... Um, <laughs> What do you make of the targeting of these great artworks? I mean, it's it's a way of trying to be fresh and innovative. And mm. I mean, I remember when I was in my previous job on the Mail Sunday, going along to a lot of the early Extinction Rebellion and covering them. Uh, and, you know, they were obviously the great, they, 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 would, they would block roads and have these great protest marches as well. I think it's a way really to get attention. Um, and they've been effective at that. Um, but as, as, as Tom says, like, you know, if you're going 55 Tufton Street, you know, it's really quite niche inside baseball Westminster kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. So you wonder, are they going to blow up the red line next or something like that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what, what, where, where do you draw the line? Um, but I, I think, yeah, attention. And um, what is interesting, of course, is, you know, it's a worldwide phenomenon as well. It's yeah. for, for a number of reasons. I think it, you know, obviously there's a lot of it, it's a bit more of it in Britain, in London, mm. but, um, it's, it's clearly something all nations have to wrestle with in terms of where do you draw the line between, uh, frankly, public nuisance and genuine public mm. debate and free expression. Yeah. And Tom, you were talking about the sort of weirdness of it. I mean, there's the yeah. wacky side of it, but then there's also the darker side. I mean, you've been looking into some of sort of Roger Hallam's yeah. um, diaries or, you know, Speeches. prison notebooks. It's really creepy. I mean, uh, Clive Martin, the formerly advice writer, said that like Extinction Rebellion is going through its helter-skelter phase. And there's a bit of something to that insofar mm. as it's all getting very dark. It's all getting very cold. So I'm not talking about Tufts Street, you know, pouring shit on... Tom Moore's cutout or whatever it was and setting people's up, setting their own arms on fire yeah. in a protest against private jets. And I think it comes down to that thing where, again, if you read what these people say, like Roger Hallam, you'll always hear these um, spokespeople come out and talk about there's going to be societal collapse, there's going to mm. be societal collapse. What they mean by that and what Roger Hallam, the, one of the founders of XR and very involved in Just Stop Oil and these offshoot groups, talks about, it's this really nightmare vision of the world is going to collapse in short order Billions will die. There will be murder and rape and all this sort of stuff. So he talks about rape all the time. Like it's really yeah. quite dark. And I think Gang rape. all this You'll sort have of your stuff. Your eyes stubbed out by a cigarette. I remember it's one of really them. graphic. That's almost a direct quote, I think. Yeah. Um, and the reason I say this is because I think you've just got to realize that we're not here talking about people who are just concerned about climate change. They're hysterical about climate change and they're quite apocalyptic. Now, I know some people are running around calling them like terrorists and so on and so forth. I think that implies a level of physical courage of which they're not actually possessed. I think, <laughs> broadly speaking, they're just there. It's a kind of day out in many respects. But um, the worldview that we're dealing with is yeah. quite bleak. It's quite anti-human. Mm. And the most chilling thing, I think, at the end of the day about all these groups is that, th th broadly speaking, the political class and the establishment have some share a lot of these concerns to a certain extent. Mm. They're just this sort of shoutier little brother of environmental politics more broadly, which is very much held by large swathes of the political class. I completely I agree. I, I think uh, that was the sense I got from going and covering these protests with a lot of people. It was like a jolly, you know, they were handing out brownies and stuff like that. And, and that's fine. You know, obviously you can have free expression, but as you say, it's then a minority who have a certain viewpoint of the mm. world, which actually, if you drill down into some of those assumptions, what they mean in terms of, you know, economic, you know, is economic growth is a bad thing. So what the def inflation being, some people remain in poverty. Um, and, and, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, I think the thing as well is that the political class does, as you say, share a lot of the assumptions we can have net zero. Mm. You know, we're going to yeah. have that. The only debate is over 2050 or 2040. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, this is something where, for better or worse, whatever you think of it, like the, the, the last 20, 25 years has been a genuine cross party consensus on this issue. So I'm really not sure often why you're going after the British government, which has quite a good record on a lot of these things. And so that's why a lot of the hysteria I think we sometimes see about, 
oh, you know, they're going to rip up all these, you know, there won't be a bonfire because they're not popular with voters and it's not what they're going to do. And it's, I think pick your targets a bit better mm. would be my advice. Yeah, and, and you kind of see that in the way that the police treat them, for instance, the kind of, uh, you know, the way that they are connected to the political class or have the sympathy of the political class because you can't imagine... Many other protesters uh, <laughs> quite getting away with sitting on the road in that way. Yeah. You can't imagine the policeman coming over, you know, to some of those anti-vaxxers or anti-lockdown protesters and saying, would you like a cup of tea? Yeah. I and- love that judge who said, um, <laughs> can I just say that your cause is correct and it's lovely being able to deal with people like you. It's not <laughs> the usual sort of people I deal with. And I, it just underlines that point. It's a very, it's a, it's a rebellion um, that is very in key with what the establishment sort of already thinks. Hmm. I think what they do, the service that they do is that they demonstrate that whilst politicians try to suggest that you can kind of pursue these sort of net zero fantasies without there being any cost, uh, these groups, because they're so out there, demonstrate, no, what they're talking about is degrowth. No, what yeah. they're talking about is you not being able to fly, to own a car, to do what you want. Hallam talks openly about it being a lockdown-style scenario in certain mm. respects. And in that sense, I think they're doing us a service. They're showing that these things have a really profound cost because of the fact that cheap, reliable energy is kind of the bedrock of why we've got good living standards. And if we throw that out, you know, we're going to end up in a We're seeing the downsides now this winter as well, when exactly. energy prices go up. If environmentalism in its current form survives this winter, yeah. I don't know what <laughs> we can do about it, really.